this like every week but would you like to ride to church with me oh come on mrs edwards you like my church we have some hot music it may not be what you're bumping at all but it's hot we get down what do you say mrs edwards oh uh, i suppose I've heard it said that 80% of first-time church visitors come because someone personally invited them. All people need to feel loved and wanted, and for some people, it just takes having someone offer to give them a ride to church. We have something great going on at this church. People's lives are being transformed by God's love. Your homework this week is to find at least one person who could use a little more of that love and invite them to come with you next week. Trust me, it's worth the extra effort. Mrs. Edward, you want to listen to some music on the way? Go ahead, your choice. <sighs> okay, here we are. team and you guys are in for somewhat of a unique service this afternoon or 
Well, it's almost afternoon. Um, Pastor Rob, who we all love and adore, and his wife Janet, who I think most of you have met. Um, Janet has had a medical emergency, and we just got the call from his daughter that she was being taken to the hospital. So Rob uh, went to go be with her. So today, you guys are gonna hear the message from our new newest member of the Odyssey Church, our newest member of our lead team, and he's actually studying Christian ministry, um, Frank Morrison. So um, bear with us, because we're all a little kind of shaken up, and we're kind of doing things a little different. We're kind of going things on the fly. And if you know Rob or myself, and Frank is the same way, we like to plan everything out. However, ironically enough, the verse that I'm going to tell you in a minute talks about how God knows the plans we have for our life. So, but if it is your first time here, we want to say welcome. And if you've never filled out one of those green cards in the pews in front of you, please do. We call those our connection cards. They are so that we can stay connected to you. If you have email, put that on there. We'll put you on. We only, I send out the email, so I send out the mailing so I can tell you we're not going to spam you. Um, but I do want to tell you a couple of things we have going on today and next week. First up is today at 2 p.m. at Indian River High School is a baccalaureate graduation service. Baccalaureate is one of those big fancy words that only spell check knows how to use. Spell, I should say. And um, it is to celebrate all our area high school graduates. And the Odyssey Church is taking part. It is the ministerium. You guys have heard us talk about the Southeast Sussex Ministerium before. They put on the Lenten services. They did the crop walk. They did Thanksgiving service. They actually recently voted to take out that long, complicated ministerium word and change their name to the Com Christian Community of Churches, which is a lot easier to spell. Um, so they are getting together. We are doing a group graduation service to recognize all of our high school graduates. We don't have any in the church this year. However, next year we will have three or more, including our own Miss Julie. So we do want to go out and show your support. And if you need directions to the school, you need more information, come see me afterwards, and I'll be happy to help you. And then next week, you've heard um, PR talk about this, Pastor Rob. Second Wind Ministries will be here for one combined service. So you guys normally come for 1115. You're going to have to get up a little bit earlier and get here at 10 um, for a combined service. Tom and Debbie Slaughter, he, has, uh, he is a chaplain in training with the Methodist Church. And she is a 9-11 survivor, so she has an amazing testimony. They also sing Southern Gospel songs. And so we're going to definitely recognize Memorial Day next week with some special things we've got planned. However, um, after that, we're going to turn, we're going to get off the stage and turn it over to them. So if you ever get sick of hearing, seeing Rob and Rice and, and myself up here week after week after week, next week's the week to come because we won't be here. Well, we will be here. We just won't be up here on the stage. Um, and then following that, we are going to celebrate Memorial Day with a potluck and cookout. We have some gourmet grill chefs in our church, and they are taking over the grill. So we're going to grill hamburgers and hot dogs. And we want you guys to bring your favorite side dish or dessert. You don't have to make a lot. We say make for about six or eight people and pass the rock. So, okay, make a lot because he eats a lot. <laughs> but go ahead and just sign up in the lobby for a side dish or dessert to bring afterwards and stay for lunch. This is the perfect time to invite someone to church. Like we just said at the beginning of the video, your homework today is to invite someone to church. Here's what you do. You tell them, hey, want to come to a picnic? See some music, might have to put up with some speakers. Pull up here. We certainly don't look like a church building out front. That's the number one thing people tell us. This doesn't look like a church, we know that. That is because church is so much more than a building. So we want you to come and bring them. But like I said, we're a little helter-skelter today because um, Rob went to be with Janet, and, um, and we're going to pray that she's OK. This week, when I was going to do the opening, I was looking for a verse. You guys have been here. You know I like to, do, to put a verse in, in, in the openings. And I love that about the Bible. When you read the Bible, I always tell people, if you've never read the Bible before, don't start at the beginning. Open it up, and God will show you what you can do, and you get immersed in it. It's amazing. So this week, he provided from Jeremiah. Jeremiah was a prophet in the Old Testament, and he lived in a time, actually not quite unlike the times we're living in now. Um, there was a lot of conflict in the world. There was a lot of wars going on, a lot of battles. 
battles, a lot of infighting, a lot of chaos. I'm sure if they had the internet and media and news, they would be waking up to the same news that we wake up every day. Another car bomb went off in some country, or another hostage situation, or another natural disaster. We talked um, last, we, we talked a couple weeks ago about the earthquakes in Nepal. And Jeremiah was like, all right, Lord, what the heck is going on here? And God gave Jeremiah these words that are found in chapter 29, verses 11 to 14. And they're kind of fitting, given that we have plans for today, and they're not going as planned. So Jeremiah said, was given these words. For know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I will listen. If you look for me wholeheartedly, you will find me. I will be found by you, says the Lord. I will end your captivity and restore your fortunes. I will gather you out of the nations where I sent you and will bring you home again to your own land. And as we wrap up the sermon series on the abundant life, where we've been walking through and knowing how to live the abundant life, not having abundance, but abundant, Frank will explain that in a little bit, I think that it's very fitting to know that at the end of the day, no matter what happens, no matter what curveballs life throws at you, God has our in his hands, he knows what he has planned for our lives, so no matter what happens, we know that we are protected and loved by him. So with that, will you pray with me? And I'm going to pray for the Welsh family as well as our service, so bear with me. Father, we come to you today thankful, so thankful and grateful that you do know what's going to happen before it ever happens. That you know the plans that you have planned out for us. So while we may not know, we know that you have us in your hands and in your heart. We know we are your children, and we know that we are so loved. Please be with us throughout the service, throughout today, and throughout our week. Be with Janet as she is being treated by the doctors. Be with the doctors who are treating her. Bring comfort to Pastor Rob and Taylor and Kayla and her whole, their whole family. Reach out your healing touch, not just upon Janet, but upon their hearts and their minds. Ease, ease, them, ease their hearts as well. Let be reminded that they are loved and they are your children as well. Be with our music team as they help us worship you in song. And be with Frank as he delivers the words. We know that we have planned for Rob to give you, to give this message today. But you had planned for Frank to give the message this time around, and we know that you're going to be with him. So just be with him as he delivers your words as we wrap up the series, Living How to Live a Life Truly Abundant in Your Love and in Your Presence. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now if you will stand, if you can, these guys have some amazing songs to give. So I'm going to turn it over to them. It doesn't matter what Satan throws our way. We're still going to worship and we're going to have fun. Amen. church 
lately, and we've been visiting about once a month out here, and we've been coming here regularly now for about a month. Uh, I am in the Navy, as Jennifer also said, that I am also studying Christian ministries through Liberty University. Um, I'm in my third year of that. So this is the first time that I've actually given a service. So we'll bear with you. Thank you. <laughs> God has spoken with uh, Pastor Rob, and he's got the words here. So I may do a lot of reading. You guys can get the same exact thing we got earlier today. So because God's words are right here. Thank God. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just um, we are coming to the end. This is the final one for the Abundant Life series, as uh, Jennifer had mentioned earlier also. Um, next week, we're doing a special service with the, um, with the concert and the Memorial Day picnic afterwards. Um, next week is very important to me. As I said, I am in the military, so Memorial Day pays tribute to those who have gone before me. And um, I'm sure my kids are glad we don't have to celebrate Memorial Day because of me. And I am too. Uh, 20, I've been in the Navy now for 23 years. I'm retiring. My last day in uniform will be next month. Not that you're so, Yeah, not that I'm counting. <laughs> I'm ready for that. Um, and then after that, the next week, July or June, uh, May 31st, Crash will be coming. They're the uh, youth group over in Ocean View. And they are one of the most organized youth groups I have ever seen. They have uh, touched Pastor Rob's life, and they've also touched mine and my kids' life. Is a very good friend of ours is involved with them also. And they, she did a mission trip last year to Costa Rica with Pastor Rob's uh, daughter also. Um, so with that, we will go ahead and get started. Um, so like I said, we're going to be finishing up the Abundant Life series today. Um, if you've missed any of the other ones, it's okay. These stand on their own also. So if you want to see any of the other ones, they are on the website. And we'll be able to, and you'll be able to catch up on it also. Now the next one that we're doing is How to Be Rich. Mm -hmm. And that one will be starting the first week of June. She's so good with these slides. <laughs> so um, now with this series, it's um, we take a topic or a subject and we just talk about it until you're tired of hearing about it, and then we'll move on to another one. Um, sorry about this. The uh, fact is that these, these series that Pastor Rob does, they're all in the Bible. We, we know what it says, and we remember what it says, but we don't always live. And with the abundant life, it's the same thing. We, we, we know about it, we know how to do it, but we don't live it. And we all forget about it. We all do. I do. My kids do. Like one of them is playing with the phone right now. Put your phone down. <laughs> um, uh, if you listen to most motivational speakers, whether they're secular or non-secular, what you'll find is even though they may never mention one word about the Bible, or Jesus Christ, the principles they use can still be found in the Bible. That's because God's word doesn't come back to void whether you believe in him or not. His word will not come back to void. The principles which are in his word, if you apply them to your life, will help you live more abundantly in his word. But according to the authors of the scriptures and according to Jesus himself, unless you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, no matter how abundantly you are living on earth, when you leave this earth, according to the prophets and the apostles, and even Jesus for all eternity, you'll be lost in a place, an indescribable torment, a place we all call hell. Now, the first thing we need to do is to define the abundant life. What does it mean to live more abundantly? The reason we need to define this is because I know, and you probably know, or if you don't know, know personally, we see them on the news all the time. A lot of people with a lot of money, people who have the popularity and power and prestige, they have a lot of material belongings, but they're not living a life that's abundant. You guys know what we're talking about there. You see them on the news all the time. MTV shows them on there all the time. Um, some of these people 
say that they work harder to hold on to what they have than how hard they had to work to get there. Um, we get abundance confused with being abundant. According to the dictionary, abundance is a noun. It's something we get. It's something we get. It's something we have. But the dictionary describes abundant as abundant as an adjective. It's descriptive. It's something we are. We can have abundance, but we become abundant. Let's suppose for a minute I could offer you a life guarantee to give you a joy that's greater than any other joy you've ever experienced. A blessedness, which is happiness in its fullest measure. An assurance of entering into the everlasting kingdom of God for all eternity. A peace that surpasses all understanding. Would you be interested? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, if you had all those things, excuse me, I don't want to sit down. That was good. <laughs> I believe if you had peace in my day to life, day to day life, and joy deep down in my heart, regardless of the circumstances of my life and assurance, that in the end all would be well. If I had all those things, then no matter how much money I had or didn't have, no matter how much fame I had or didn't have, if I had peace, joy, and assurance, I'd be living life and living it more abundantly. Uh, I mean, for me, that, that speaks truly to me because, I mean, I'm in the military. I mean, I know a lot of people think we get paid a lot of money, but I'm sure you, my, my daughter and my son right here will let you know, no, we have a house. And we have groceries, and we do. <laughs> and we have church. And so, but I know that I have my God, and Jesus died for me, and everybody else. Now, whether they believe it or not, it's up to them. All I can do is live my life as an example for them to know, hey, this is what happened. It's in, it's, you can read about it. In the Bible, it's in the history books. This actually happened. There's physical proof that this happened. And whether you believe or not believe, it's your choice. This is what I believe. Of course, I can't offer you such life, but Jesus can, and he does. He makes that promise in John 10, 10. I have come, they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. And Jesus offers this abundant life not only by his sacrificial death on the cross, but also by his teachings, recorded by his apostles and friends. And even the teachings of two of his brothers, James and Jude. Through the inspired word of God, the teachings of Jesus and the writings of his apostles, we can learn that the secrets of life, the more abundant life, and there are many principles which are found in God's words. So we could never cover them all in just a couple of weeks. And that's why you need to have a Bible and read it at home. And grab, there's one left over here, and I know he said he has more coming next week. So if you don't have a Bible, we have one here, and then there'll be more coming next week. Okay? Because I, I mean, yeah, like my daughter, she has hers on her phone, I have mine on my phone. Every morning I go to work, I do my morning devotionals and I can listen to it while I'm driving into work. So I live in Salisbury, but drive to Wallops Island every day, so I have that hour to work and an hour back to work where I can have my devotionals and listen to the Word of God. Um, we start this series by saying God wanted us to do a new thing in our lives. We can expect great things from a great God. And then we ask the question, Will you let him do something? Will you let him do this new thing? Will you let him do this thing he's already planned out for you in your life? And that's exactly what it is. He already knows what's going to happen with you, with me. But I don't know his plan for me. And I don't know his plan for my daughter or my Bathroom. son, who is not right there right now. I, I don't know his plan. Only he knows it. And I don't know where you are in your life right now, if you're having troubles in your finances, 
then I believe God wants you to do a new thing in your finances. If you're having troubles in your marriage or some other relationships, then I believe God wants you to do a new thing in your relationships. Wherever it is in your life, you need a new thing. I believe God desires and God wants you to do this new thing for you, but you have to do your part. I'm having issues right now, and, and, and me and my fiance have had to take a step back, and we have to adjust things. But I know God knows what he's doing, and I just have to step back and let him do his will. And that's exactly it. It's his will. I know that we're both living our lives for him, and that he has a plan for us, and we will be okay in the end. But I also know he cares more about your future than he does about your past. You can be so good, God will love you more. And you can't be so bad, he'll ever love you less. Perfect example of that. Who knows who Saul is? Okay? Saul was a man who was executing Christians right after the resurrection and the ascension back up. Saul actually wrote... 75% of the New Testament as Paul because on the road to Damascus Saul saw Jesus and Jesus talked to Saul and he used Ananias to pass the word on to Saul and then he became known as Paul and started 75% of the New Testament he didn't care about his past he knew what he did. And he used him to spread his word. And he cares way more about eternal things than he does about material things that are going that are going to pass away. God's greatest desires is he'll do a new thing for your eternal life. For greatest desire is that you commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And by simple faith, you put your trust in him and surrender all you have to his will and surrender all in obedience to commitment our words and don't like because they mean we're allowing someone else to direct the place we go and the things we do but you know the person who was directing you always had your best interest in mind it wouldn't be such a pleasure to allow them to do these things that's where faith comes in quote probably one of my favorite songs that I've ever heard. Um, American Idol contestant Carrie Underwood, Jesus Take the Wheel. And that's who's guiding you. It seems like such an easy thing to do, but as we've seen over the last five weeks, it may be easy, but it does take work. So today, I want to end this series where it began. God wants to do a new thing in your life. That will lead to an everlasting life, an eternal life of more abundance. I want to tell you about the new things that happen when you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll end up where we began with God wanting, the desire, wanting and desiring to do a new thing in your life. But not just your life here on earth, your life after you leave this earth. All this was predicted by the prophet Isaiah more than 2,700 years ago. Isaiah wrote these words, the ones we drew our text in from the first message of this series. Isaiah chapter 43, 18 and 19. But forget all that is nothing compared to what I am going to do, for I am about to do something new. See, I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness, I will create rivers in the dry wastelands. And in the context of what Isaiah, Isaiah, I'm starting to sound like the guy on uh, AD, the Bible continues. Um, and in the context of what Isaiah wrote, is God created you and formed you. He tells us that in verse 1, in verse 1, God says, don't be afraid. He has ransomed you. He's paid the price for your freedom. He says in verse 2, He'll be with you in the deep waters, and He won't let you drown. 
Who in here feels like they're in deep waters right now? I'm in the Navy. I'm always in deep waters. <laughs> um, what you need to remember is God's with you, and he won't let you drown. Anybody in here who feels like they're in deep waters besides me, maybe drowning in debt, maybe drowning in a personal relationship, maybe drowning in an addiction, or you're in over your head. Your job's just too tough. Don't worry. God says he is with you, and he will not let you drown. He says when you go through the fires, I'll be with you. Now, I won't let you get burned up. And I've been through some fires in my life. Maybe you have too. Or you're going through some now. Just remember, you may get burned, but he will not let you be burned up. And there's a difference. In verse 3, God calls himself our Savior. In verse 4, God says, you're precious to me. You're honored and he loves you. Can you imagine this? You're honored and loved by God, the creator of everything seen and unseen. It blows me away to think of it, but it's true. In verse 7, God says, Bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for my glory. It was I who created them. God created us to glorify God. It just <coughs> keeps getting better and better. Verse 13, he says, no one can snatch you out of my hand. And in verse 14, I am your redeemer. And then God goes on to list some things, some of the things he's done for the Israelites and how he saved them from bondage and slavery. And in the past, and Israel is simply a picture of everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus. Israel is simply a physical picture of spiritual truth. When they were standing at the Jordan River at the Promised Land, God told Moses he would not enter the Promised Land. But he told, for his last messages to Moses was, everybody has to leave their past behind them and cross the river. If they do not leave their past behind them, they will perish. At the Jordan River, that was Israel's picture of this is where we are. That's our future. That's our past. It's time to leave the past behind us. And he built us to, and he built us to this peak. And God says, but forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do. For I'm about to do something new. See, I've already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness and create rivers and the dry wastelands. All the things God's, all great things I've done for you in the past and all the terrible things you've done in the past, forget all the past. There's no need to remember it. It's nothing new in the past, right? That's why it's in the past. Forget all of it because I'm about to do something new. And this new thing I'm about to do is nothing compared to what I've already done. This new thing is so great, those other great things I've done fail in comparison. God says, in fact, what I am about to do, I've already started to do. Don't you see it and don't you know that the wilderness, those problems you got, I'm about to make a pathway right through them. You just keep walking and I'll cut down the trees. Those dry areas of your life, I'm about to bring them water and give them life. I'm going to bring life to some areas of your life you thought were already dead. Look around at our church. Don't you see it? Don't you feel it? There's people who are coming here who weren't going to church. How many people never went to church before? Okay. Going to church a couple of months ago, there's people in here who have actually who are actually now volunteering. Bryce, Julie, Brady, me. I never thought I'd be up here doing this a couple of months ago. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer. Um, none of us thought we would be where we are today a few months ago and here we are so here we are serving a church God is about to do something new in the lives of some people in here and in the Odyssey church 
they're on the verge of living a more, you guys are, all of us are on the verge of living a more abundant life. But in order to get to this new thing, we must do something new. In just the New Testament alone, the word new is used 162 times. 162 times. And in almost every case, either Jesus or somebody else is talking about this new thing God wants to do for us. And in order for us to have this new thing, which the Apostle Paul came back again. I guess I got ahead of myself remembering from the first service. <laughs> um, calls a gift, there's only one requirement. It was the message of the prophets of the Old Testament. It was the message of John the Baptist when he was announcing the arrival of Jesus. It's the first recorded message of Jesus as he stated his earthly ministry and uh, stated as he started his earthly ministry. After being tempted in the desert by Satan, its message, Jesus told his disciples to speak as they were sent out two by two to spread God's news. It's the message of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter and, and the Apostle John. And here it is. God loves you. Jennifer may not, I may not, but God loves you. And he wants you to stop doing the things you know are wrong and start doing the things you know are right. God loves you, so quit living for this world and start living for the next world. Which is closer than you think. We usually translate it something like this. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent simply means change the way you think. So you change the way you act. Stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about God. And your neighbor. Quit loving yourself so much and start loving others. And loving God. And loving God. You know, that statement right there reminds me, I was doing homework this week. And um, I, I was doing one of my quizzes. And one of the questions was, was I'm taking a theology class right now. One of the questions was, what did, God, what did Jesus say was the greatest commandment? When one of the Pharisees asked him, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus simply said, Love God above all others. And then the second most important is love your neighbor as you would love yourself. We usually translate it into something like, I'm sorry, God loves you and he desires only the best for you. So he sent Jesus so we could have life and have it more abundantly. We just have to quit living for ourselves and start living for him. In other words, stop trusting in us and our things and start trusting in God. First thing which happens when you change the way you think, so you change the way you act and put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, is God gives us a new life. We get this new life because we have a new relationship with God. When Paul wrote to to the Christians in Corinth, he told them, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, and the new life has begun. It's more than just saying the words that you accept Jesus as your Savior. You have to act. You have to be different. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul says, we're separated from God because of our sin, and not just separated from Him, but alienated from Him. The Apostle Paul, who was writing to Christians in Ephesus, says we're excluded without hope and without God in this world. But Paul also writes in another letter, and Paul says, when we confess with our mouth and believe in our hearts, Jesus Christ is Lord, God takes away all our sins, not just part of them, all of them. You could have went out Rob the bank. And if you came in here and you said with your mouth and trusted in your heart that Jesus is your Savior, 
and you want to follow, would have been forgiven. Your forgiveness, the past is gone. You're God, you have a new relationship with God. To be without hope and without God is not where you want to be. People without hope and without God are a lost person. The only thing which separated you from God is your sins. Now, your sins have been removed. And now, you've been reconciled or made right with God himself. When you let Jesus be Lord of your life, you can now stand there, stand before holy ground and not in righteousness, but in, not in your righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. You're no longer God's enemy, but now you're called his friend. The Apostle Paul tells us, since you are now justified through faith, you can have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The way to remember what justified means is when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God takes all the bad things you've ever done, your sins, and makes it just as if they never happened. When you know your sins are just as if they had never happened, when you're justified, you can have peace that surpasses all human understanding. And when you have that kind of peace, you can live and live it more abundantly. We aren't just friends when God does this new thing in our life. Jesus said, we've been born again. Not only are we his friends, we become his children. Paul tells us we've been adopted if we've been given our lives to Jesus Christ. God has adopted us into his family. And when we're adopted into his family, we get a new citizenship. The Apostle Paul writes in Romans, So you've not received the spirit that makes you fearful of slaves, fearful slaves. Instead, you've received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him for his spirit. Joins us with him to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are children, we are his heirs. The fact together, Christ we are heirs of the glory of God. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his sufferings. A new father, a new family. We are adopted in God's family. And Jesus says in the book of Revelations, chapter 3, verse 12, All who are victorious will become pillars in the temple of God temple of my God and will never have to leave and will never have to leave it and I will write on them the name of my God and they will be citizens in the city of my God the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven from God and I will also write on them my new name we now become a new citizen of his city I have friends or Pastor Rob has friends who are looking to <laughs> adopt a child from overseas. When they adopt this child, the child will have both a biological father and a new father. They will have a family in their, in their new country, in their new home country, and now they will have a family in this country. They will have dual citizenship, citizenship of their old country, and now the citizenship of their new country. It's the same with us. When we take Jesus to be our Lord and Savior, we have our biological family here on earth. We have our heavenly family in heaven. But now we have a heavenly father, and now we're members of his family too. God gives us a new family to hold us accountable and to make us ever strong, stronger than before, than we were before. You aren't just related to God. You are now related to every other believer in the world. Everyone who truly believes Jesus Christ is the Son of God and has repented of their sins and believed in His now. Now with that perfect example the other day, I 
was upset with somebody because I lived three hours from where I needed to go and she lives an hour. And so I decided I was gonna vent my frustrations on Facebook. Way to go, genius. You live an hour away, I live three hours away. I got there first. Here's a shocker, you live in a place that has two and a half million people living there. Traffic exists. Somebody called me and said, that's not showing kindness. And she was absolutely right. That was not showing kindness or understanding. So see, one of my family members said, hey, that's not being godlike what you just did there. And I'm like, thank you for pointing that out for me. I apologize for what I did. It happens. Get frustrated. We're bound together in God's family, not by an organization, but by the church. And by a spiritual relationship. We're told we're members of God's household. The most frequently term, the most frequently used term for that is Christians. And the Bible is underlying our family relationships. But you can't stay in the past to get this new life. When you commit your life to Christ, He wants to make you a new citizen. You're still a citizen of a particular country. You're still a citizen of the United States. But now you'll also be a citizen of the kingdom. The important thing is you need to forget about what you did in your past and cross that Jordan River. As long as we're here on earth, we possess dual citizenships. On one hand, we're to give our allegiance to our nation, and we're called to be good citizens. But we're also citizens of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God in which Christ is. Our loyalty is to Him. If someone tells us to do something that goes against God's Word, the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 29, we must obey God rather than men. Revelations 11, 15, the Apostle John tells us, the Bible reminds us one day, this world, this kingdom, the United States, and this whole earth, and everything on it, will become the kingdom of our Lord. And of and of his Christ, and he will reign forever and ever. In his first recorded sermon, Gospel of, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, Jesus declared, The time has come. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus made it clear this wasn't an earthly kingdom or a political kingdom, but a heavenly spiritual kingdom where God rules over everything. Paul reminded us, our citizenship is in heaven. When we make a decision to let Jesus rule our lives, we have a new thing. We have a new joy because we know we're living for a new family, the family of God, and a new citizenship in heaven, and no longer for something that's material and will go away. We're now living for something that's everlasting and an eternal life. Who's heard of B.B. King? He died recently. Oh, I didn't know that. He died, what was it? Thursday? Thursday? Yeah. Um, and I made a statement, and I was like, well, I hope they bury him with Lucille. For those of you guys who really know his music, Lucille is his guitar. He's been playing that since the 20s. And then I thought about it, I go, well, that's materialistic. It's not going to go with them. I still wouldn't like to see somebody make a lot of money off that guitar. It still wouldn't be right. But it's materialistic. If he gets buried with it or not, it's not going with them. And when we have that kind of joy, we are not dwelling on the past, but looking forward to what's to come in the future. Because what's to come in the future is nothing compared to what's going on right now. But not only do we need it, but, sorry, but not only do we have a new life and a new heavenly father and a new family and a new citizenship when we come to Jesus Christ we have new purpose in life little by little we begin to get more and more desire of what's to come you can always tell when I go away from his notes and do something that I get tongue tied <laughs> uh, we know we're created by God and for God and for his purpose God, and for God and for his purpose we're created to glorify God in everything we do we know our purpose isn't to live for ourselves in 2 Corinthians Paul writes he died for everyone 
so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ, who died and was raised for them. We know our purpose is to live for him who has died for us and was raised again. For he died for us, we can do, all we can do is live for him. God wants his desire, God wants, he desires to do a new thing in our life and in our lives to give us new life, to give us a new heavenly family and a new citizenship to give us a new purpose. When God does a new thing, we know that our purpose is we set, we make up our minds on purpose to go in the direction that will fulfill the purpose God has created for all of us. One of the Bible's most comforting truths is that when we come to Christ, God himself comes alive within us. By his Holy Spirit, Paul assures us in the book of Romans, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And we know we don't have to go alone when we ask Jesus to come into our lives. In that same chapter of Romans, chapter 8, Paul writes, you however, you, however, are controlled not by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit of God. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not know the Spirit of God, Christ, he does not belong to Christ. If you know Jesus Christ, you don't have to be, you don't have to beg the Holy Spirit to come into your life. He's already there. Therefore, you feel his presence. Not God. You, you feel his presence or not. God gives us the Holy Spirit. So not only do we know our purpose, and not only do we know what direction to go into, God has also given us the new power to achieve, to do what it is that he wants us to do. God wants to do a new thing. He wants to give you a new life, a new family, a new citizenship. Our new purpose, a new power. We make a decision for Jesus, and now we want to live for Christ, and not just for ourselves. We begin to see other people differently, not for what they can do for us, but what they can do for them. Or but what we can do for them, sorry. Paul says in Ephesians 2.10, For we are God's workmanship, created in Jesus Christ to do good work, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Jesus promised us we'll receive new power when the Holy Spirit comes upon us. We aren't meant to live the Christian life in our own strength, God has provided His Spirit to us. He gives us the power to have what He wants us to have and to what He wants us to do and not give up until we get it. It's the same power that Jesus received in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's amazing what you can do when you know your purpose and you set the direction of your life towards the purpose and the power of the Holy Spirit. But do not give up when things go tough. When things get tough, that's when you have to pray harder. And that's when you need help to pray harder. What if Jesus, in the garden, on the night before he was going to the cross, what if Jesus simply gave up? He said, no, I'm going to die anyways. It's okay. They'll be okay. Because it was getting too hard. Things were getting tough Things are getting too tough for him. No. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he said, Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? The Holy Spirit gave Jesus the power to say, I'm not going to quit just because it's starting to get hard. This is the purpose for which I came. I'm going to press through and finish the job. Make up your mind right now. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you'll finish what you started. You have no idea what God can do through you if you, if you don't hang in there. 
When we ask Jesus into our hearts, we repent of our sins, and we put our past behind us. God gives us new things. He gives us new life by giving us a new relationship with Him. He gives us a new family, a new citizenship into the kingdom of God. He gives us new purpose with new power to go to the new direction. New direction leads us to a new destiny. When someone makes Jesus their Lord and Savior, we say they've been converted. The word conversion means to change. And when we come to Christ, God gives us a new direction and a new destiny. Once we're once we were headed for hell, now we're headed for heaven. Once we're bound for eternal separation from God, now we'll live forever with Him. Once we had no hope of eternal life, now we do. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice Paul says it's a gift of eternal life. So many people think they must earn their salvation by their own good works. But you can never be good enough to earn your way into heaven because God's standards is perfection. Our only hope is in the Lord, is in the Lord Jesus Christ who purchased our salvation at the cost of his own blood and now offers it for us for free as a gift. But we must reach out and accept that gift. In 1 Peter chapter 1, the Holy Spirit tells us, Praise be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In great mercy, He has given us new birth and into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Keep in heaven for you. What a gift. And when, we, and when you have the assurance, when we have the assurance of eternal life, the Christ, with Christ, you can live forever. And you can live it more abundantly because you know your treasure is no longer in things which will perish and fade away, but stored up in heaven where moth and rust not destroy where thieves do not break in and steal. God wants to do a new thing in your life. Can you feel it? Can you perceive it? Who wants to make paths where there are no paths? He wants to bring life where there's no life. He wants to be he wants to give a whole new thing. He wants to give you a whole new journey, a new odyssey whole new path to follow until the day he takes us to heaven. Looks like God is doing new things. It looks like it's plural. He's doing more than one thing. New life because of a new relationship, a new family with a new heavenly father and the whole body of Christ as our brothers and sisters, a new city with a new citizenship, a new purpose with a new power to go into the direction so we can have a new destiny. Why does God say he wants a new thing when it looks like he's doing the same old things? He's doing a new thing. If you can perceive it, and you can, then you can feel it. He's already started, and nothing compared to what he's done before is what's coming next for you in your life. It's brand new. Paul writes about the new for you in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. God's done a new thing. You've been born again. There's a new brand new you, and you're a new person with a new life. God says, you know all those good things I've done for you and in the past and even the good things that I've done for you don't even you don't even know about and all those terrible things you've done in the past you thought I'd forget about 
Forget all that. It is nothing compared to what I'm going to do for you. In other words, your decisions for Christ <laughs> and Jennifer's car. <laughs> In other words, your decisions for Christ isn't an end, but a beginning. The beginning of a brand new thing. A brand new, more abundant life. We aren't only called to become Christians. We're also called to be Christians. Yeah. Don't ever think faith in Christ is just some type of spiritual life insurance. Something we get and then we put away until we need it. And we need it to get into heaven. Christian life is a new thing, a new journey, and a new odyssey. One that will take us the rest of our lives. And the best part is we never walk it alone. Christ walks it with us. It's like the uh, poem, Footprints in the Sand. And why are there sometimes there are only one set of footprints? And that's where Christ says, that's where I carried you. And Jesus wants us to remember what it cost him to give us the new life. Jesus gave us a way to remember these new things. He died and he lived and he rose again to give us that new covenant. After supper, he took another cup of wine. He said, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice. The Lord invites you to his table to remember the new things he desires for each of us. One of us has to have all who love him, all who have repented of their sins and seek to live in peace with one, with one another are invited to his table. Not only does God give us a new life because of a new relationship with him, not only does he give us a new family and a new citizenship into his kingdom and a new purpose, a new power, a new direction, and a new destiny, in a new journey. God gave us a new covenant so we can know he's done a new thing in our life. You are new. You are a new you, and God sealed it with this covenant and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're going to do communion. This is where I'm going to do. Put this away. <laughs> All right, so we're going to do communion. And I'm going to do a passage for it. And then I'm going to ask everybody to come up to the center aisle. And you'll break off a piece of the bread. And you'll dip it in the wine. The bread is to represent the body of Christ. And the wine is to represent the blood of Christ. So, Brady, Julian, it's not real wine. Sorry. If you're under 21, sorry. It's not real wine. <laughs> we are not. Oh, we're going to leave here, please. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread and gave thanks to the Father. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Name your car. <laughs> when the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many and for many for the forgiveness of the sins. Do this often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Because there is one loaf, 
Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the loaf, of the bread, which we break, is a sharing in the body of Christ. Okay, so now as I ask, I'll have, ask everybody to come up, break a piece of bread, and dip it into the wine. our service. Can we give him a hand? Can we... I shouted out about 10 minutes before the service started that he would be doing this. We invite you to come back next week. Remember, if you're here at this service, if you show up at 1115, you will miss the service, but you will still be here in time for the food, so that's up to you. Um, go forth in the name of Christ. And may you always live abundantly. In his precious, precious name we pray. Amen. And now excuse us while we pack all of our equipment up because we've got to get it over to the high school. And I have about 30 minutes to get there and set up before the service starts. So please go forth in the name of Christ and we will see you next week. And also I heard from Taylor. Her mom is doing better. So she is out of danger. And praise God for that. So he, she is doing well, and Pastor Rob sends his love to all of you. So go forth and enjoy the rest of your day. We hope to see you next week at 10 a.m. Thank you so much. Good practice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Bye, Gentlemen, ladies. She called me a lady. All right, love you, honey.